Welcome everyone. I'm Rich Berliner from Connected Real Estate. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today with an esteemed panel for our CBRS panel. Um, I would like to um, introduce the folks that are on the panel to you. Uh, but before we do, I just want to uh, make a couple of remarks that uh, this is our uh, premier panel because CBRS is very much a cornerstone of what we're doing here. Uh, there were some interesting questions and thoughts that came out of our view from the top panel this morning, and we're going to address some of those here. Uh, but uh, I'd like to thank all of you for all of the panelists for being here today. First and foremost, we have uh, John Gilbert from Rudin Management, who is going to be our moderator for today. Uh, Rod Nelson from Geoverse. Uh, we have David Wright from CBRS Alliance. Uh, Paul Reddick from Crown Castle. Tormod, La Tormod Larson from Extinet. And Bill Shoulders from Antenna Systems. Uh, gentlemen, thank you all for being here today. And uh, just before we start, um, a, a couple of things. Uh, please, all of the attendees here, um, I just want to make a point that um, please go and visit our um, exhibits and our exhibitors on the floor, on the show floor. Uh, we have great companies like Ascensus, uh, Zenfi, Geoverse, um, and many others. And please go and, and view their exhibits and interact with some of the members of the team from the companies. Um, and uh, also I'd like to encourage all of you to go to the chat rooms. Uh, you can go through the lounge or through the, the uh, exhibits. Um, so uh, the other thing I'd like to just cover really quickly is I mentioned that we had an earlier panel today um, on uh, the called the view from the top. And we had a number of interesting real estate um, executives. One of them was JP Flaherty, who John, you know well. Um, and uh, JP made a comment that he's had a number of vendors come and visit with him. And they had different interpretations of what CBRS was all about. Um, and he mentioned that he made a comment that he was under the impression that the frequencies that were given could be taken away uh, by the government, uh, which doesn't happen to be the case. In addition to that, um, you know, I, uh, I let everyone know that this panel was going on and that John was going, John Gilbert was going to be moderating. And another one of the panelists, Kent Tarek, made the comment that if John Gilbert is exploring it, that's good enough for me. I need to explore it too. So without further ado, John, um, I think that's the reason why this is such an important panel to clear up a lot of the um, misunderstandings and figure out what is CBRS, what can it do for landlords and real estate owners like you, and without further ado, floor is yours. Thanks, Rich, and uh, thanks to uh, my fellow panelists. I, you know, I've tried my entire career to uh, surround myself with people who are smarter than I am, because that's the only way I can learn. And uh, boy, uh, Rich, you did a great job in assembling this panel because it's it's an all-star team. Uh, you know, at Rudin, you know, where I'm chief operating officer, we're constantly looking at new technologies and trying to do what we do all day, every day better each day. Uh, because if we stand still, we're going to get run over. And, uh, you know, I've been doing real estate for almost 40 years now, 27 of it with Rudin. And I have never seen an opportunity like CBRS. I've never seen a moment where the government has said to property owners and to carriers and to large and small and medium sized enterprise tenants, here is a gift. And so what we're hoping to do today is to unwrap that gift, take a look at it, peek under the, in, in, inside this box that, that the FCC has opened for us and really understand the value that is represented here, both to property owners, enterprise customers, to the carriers, uh, as well as to the vendors and the integrators that ultimately are gonna install this. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask the first question, I'm gonna ask David Wright, the president of the CBRS Alliance, to tell us what the heck is CBRS? Great, thanks, uh, thanks, John. Thanks, Rich, for the opportunity to participate. And um, and I'll just say, John, you know, thank you for the the kind words to me and the fellow panelists on uh, on bringing some expertise here. I, I'm really grateful that uh, you're bringing your uh, property management expertise because that's something I know nothing about. I can talk about wireless and spectrum, but um, when we get into some of the business specifics, um, 
for the uh, the real estate industry. That's certainly out of my depth. So um, uh, likewise, in terms of uh, the appreciation for the expertise that's in view here. Um, so what is CBRS? Okay, so I agree with John. You know, this is a watershed moment in um, you know, wireless services and access to spectrum. Uh, and essentially what we've done is we've taken a prime chunk of mid-band spectrum right in the 3.5 gigahertz range. And this is spectrum that globally is available for cellular services. In a lot of places, it's been exclusively licensed on a national or regional basis. But in the U.S., because of some of the specific um, you know, situation with incumbent operations and, and the government services, and I do want to address the question about can the government take it back, short version is not not really no um, but um, because there are government operations there and we're going to continue to a lot you know facilitate those government operations but introduce new commercial services what that's sort of coming you know with the fruition of all of that is we're creating this new three-tiered sharing framework and I don't want to get too far in the weeds uh, I don't want people's eyes to gloss over but what it really means is while allowing those government users to continue operating, we're introducing two new tiers of commercial service in this uh, 150 megahertz of spectrum. And that's a lot of spectrum, by the way, for a cellular oriented band. Um, and those two tiers of service, one is very analogous to what we've seen with licensed spectrum over the years and what you can do with licensed, exclusively licensed protected spectrum. And the other portion of it, the other tier, is very analogous to what we have with unlicensed spectrum. And so we're mixing and matching all three of these different tiers or use cases, um, access types, into a single framework. And what that really means, again, for the viewers, is we're going to democratize access for technologies like 4G LTE and 5G new radio, which is, you know, all the buzz today is about what's coming with 5G. You hear a lot about private LTE, private 5G. CBRS in the U.S. is a great enabler for those services because it's interesting and impactful to the MNOs. So AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile uh, are very involved in this, of course, but it's also impactful and of interest to the cable industry, the cable operators, uh, fixed wireless players. But as importantly, as, a, as an enterprise, as a property owner, you now have the opportunity to deploy an LTE or a 5G solution today to meet your connectivity requirements without having to jump through hoops to buy, you know, spectrum at auction. Um, you can do that at what's called the GAA tier, which is the quasi-unlicensed, um, or you can obtain a protected access right, you know, same that the, the mobile operators have essentially. Um, at the what's called priority access tier. So I think we're going to look back 20 years from now and say, you know, you know, all the things that we enjoy today with unlicensed spectrum, so Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, you know, all the things we've enjoyed with licensed spectrum, LTE, 5G, 3G for that matter, um, you know, that's all been enabled because of the existing paradigms of licensed and unlicensed. 20 years from now, we're going to look back and say, wow, CBRS introduced a whole new way of managing spectrum. And it's just as impactful as uh, as unlicensed and licensed have been. Well, Rod Nelson, you, you have spent mm -hmm. your entire career living in that wireless spectrum uh, at AT and T, and now as CEO of, of Geoverse. What? How much bandwidth is this 150 megahertz? You know, is it a lot? Is it a little? You know, what can owners expect from that? And 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 how do you see that that amount of spectrum? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> thanks, John. Uh, you know, 150 megahertz is a lot of spectrum. A um, couple of ways to think about it, you know, most of the tier one operators today are operating with about that much, or that could be more than some of the operators have in total uh, to run the nationwide networks that we know today at massive scale. Um, you know, another way to think about it is in the early days when we were sort of building out the industry, you know, the, we and others were trying to do that with just a tiny sliver of like 25 or 30 megahertz. And we built entire nationwide networks and, and a huge industry with that. Now you have five times that amount that you can use in a single building. So it's really impressive. So I know I've always been taught that there's no such thing as too much bandwidth, but is this adequate? for property owners to do what they want to do and from an IOT standpoint 
and also to feed our enterprise customers in terms of them creating their own private LTE networks? Yeah, I mean, it's tons of spectrum, right? And you can reuse it within the building. So you can take the same spectrum and use it on, you know, one floor and on another floor and on another floor. And so you really get this multiplying effect. Um, I'm sure we'll get into it when we talk about use cases, but the really important thing I think to understand is that this is a multi-purpose network that can drive a whole host of, of uh, business critical functionality. But unlike some other technologies, you know, this is also LTE, which makes it automatically compatible with the networks that the, that the operators are building outside. So we're gonna see a level of mobility between you know, the outdoor networks being able to roam onto these uh, CBRS networks uh, to, to not only power the, the business critical functions inside the enterprise, but also to create a neutral host and Paul Reddick, um, you, know, you spent a good amount of your career at Google. Uh, why do you care about this? I'm fascinated by, you know, in 2012, that when the FCC actually started studying this, you know, do you, what was the impetus for that? And, and what is Crown Castle? Why, why do you care about this? Yes, yeah, so, you know, I do care about it. And thanks for having me on. And I think property owners should care about it too. But just giving a little bit of background, uh, back in 2012, there was a, a President's Council on Technology and there were a number of people on that council rec making recommendations to the FCC on what should be done with Spectrum. And uh, Milo Medin was on that and he was my, uh, my boss at, at Google for a period. And I learned a lot on the background there around how uh, they've used the word democratization, that we needed to have a great democratization so that building owners and smaller players who might want smaller geographic regions, for example, to get their hands on, on licensed spectrum. Um, I, unlicensed spectrum has been great for us, but licensed spectrum and managed networks present all kinds of new opportunities. And um, so Google was really in favor of that and kind of unleashing more spectrum, unleashing more capability, more players. Um, for me, uh, from a Crown Castle perspective, and I looked at Crown from the time I was at Google as well, um, what that does is open up not just the sharing of spectrum, but the sharing of equipment at the end of the day, because now you can have multiple different entities running on the same equipment and Crown's a shared infrastructure company. So when we looked from Google, we said like, who is positioned well to play in this market? Crown was one of those companies. Um, from, a, from a building owner perspective, um, I, I think it's just a, it's a big gift uh, that the FCC's made that building owners can take advantage of. Well, let's talk about that. Tormod, I, I know, you know, at Extinet, you, you've done some interesting things in, in the industrial uh, spectrum and in, you know, in terms of manufacturing and, and port, man, port management. Can you talk about the, the use cases that, that you've been able to actualize with Extinet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and first of all, thank you for having me here today. Um, at, at a high level, um, we've seen kind of five categories of use cases for the CBRS spectrum. Um, fixed wireless, um, basically just extending uh, broadband connectivity, a lot of times in, in rural markets. Um, that's actually what we started and we have about 2000 sites uh, under contract right now uh, to build out uh, fixed wireless in, in, in um, a number of communities throughout the, the country. Um, Somebody mentioned um, the carriers. Um, the carriers look upon actually CBRS spectrum as an additional spectrum to what they have. Um, so it's more traditional and it's a PAL license, a priority access license coming uh, up here um, uh, shortly on, on that as well. Um, and then you have new carriers like the Cable Coast that we're also working with. Um, and uh, those are, I would say, more traditional um, customers and, 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 and people that be using Spectrum and, and this is just a new um, uh, amount of Spectrum that they could, could leverage. What's really exciting and you mentioned it is it's more under the umbrella of private LTE. Um, and now you're getting into a little bit more of the specific verticals and applications that exist there. So for example, in, in industrial manufacturing, 
work with a number of manufacturers that are looking at autonomous manufacturing. So basically connecting their uh, robots and, and all of the, the equipment in their um, facilities and um, be able to leverage a more secure network with a uh, more a better performing network um, relative to Wi-Fi. Um, also that has some of the mobility aspects that, that Rod um, mentioned, I think is, is, is part of this. And that's, you know, a lot of these have actually tried Wi-Fi and haven't been successful or as successful with it. Um, we're also working with a, a number of ports, same kind of thing, just at a larger scale in this outdoor, um, where the, the cradle carriers are connected and, and they even have like um, vision systems to do uh, barcode reading. It's actually not barcodes, it's actually the, the, the like a license plate reader, those type of things. Um, in hospitality, um, we see a lot of payment applications. Um, you know, security is important there. Uh, we see the same thing in sports and entertainment where um, they have issues with um, payment or just registering um, parking passes because there's so many people coming in and Wi-Fi and the, and the traditional uh, public networks can't uh, deal with it. And then it's some interesting, and this is a little bit more futuristic, where people are, are start looking at, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality type um, applications everything from sports and entertainment to even uh, we have some commercial real estate uh, players that, that are looking at that. And then in commercial real estate, um, you know, I think you could attest to a little bit, but building management systems, um, how do you stay independent of your tenants and how do you have a network that could be secure for that? Um, we see, you know, that taking up and specifically now with, with uh, the COVID uh, uh, situation, uh, connecting, um, you know, uh, temperature scanners or even facial recognition. How do you uh, facilitate um, touchless entries? How do you have a little bit more um, information about the people and how many people and the crowds you have in your, your facility? Um, and then um, even like I mentioned fixed wireless, but that the equivalent of that in commercial real estate is how do you uh, support flex spaces uh, where people coming in on a temporary basis and, and need uh, broadband. So those are just a few uh, use cases. So it's, it's pretty um, interesting where for somebody like us, it's been very, um, you know, it's connectivity and our customers are, you know, a cell phone service. And now it's so many different uh, applications out there that we see uh, customers, um, exploring or actually deploying uh, as we speak. Rod and Paul, you want to add in, in terms of, of your experiences on use cases? Yeah, I just one thing I would say is they're not mutually exclusive. So especially when it comes to in building, it can be MNO coverage, it can be um, building management, it can be bandwidth for enterprises in the building, it can be all kinds of vertical applications, whether it's push to talk, all kinds of things that people might want to do. And so it's multi-purpose. So the main, main point is that they're not mutually exclusive, all these use cases. I will say the fixed wireless outdoors may be different than what you do in a building, but outside of that, there's a lot you can do. Rod, anything to add? Yeah, I think one of the other ones that wasn't mentioned that we've been involved in is you know, to power the information and digital signage. And uh, you know that allows you a lot of flexibility in the placement, movement of of screens around the uh, exterior, interior of, of facilities, whether it's a shopping mall, it could be a sports stadium. And uh, you know, you're able to drive content to those screens effectively, uh, much more cost effectively than having to pull cabling into those locations. So that's another one we've seen that uh, really has a good business case. Yeah, we're excited about the uh, you know, mobile security uh, cameras to be able to move them around as long as we can power them either via battery or uh, you know, plug it in somewhere to be able to connect back to network to grab those video images is, is really important where it's really hard to get, get a wire uh, on the, the, either the interior or an exterior of the building. So to me, that's another, another use case. Yeah. Bill, um, you know, property owners, the phone rings, 
and it's a DAS provider and the phone that he hangs up and the phone rings and it's a ubiquitous Wi-Fi provider. Uh, you know, how do we separate all of these different uh, wireless and wired uh, solutions that, that property owners need to understand? And where do you, where do you see CBRS coming out uh, in, in, in this whole food chain? Sure. <clears throat> So I think we have to look at CVRS as more complementary to Wi-Fi and DAS. CVRS is not going to replace Wi-Fi and it's not going to replace DAS. If you can solve a problem today using Wi-Fi, you should do it. If there's Wi-Fi in the cafeteria for laptops, you should continue to service that area with Wi-Fi. I think where CVRS has a, has a play is in those critical business applications. Uh, systems that need to be secure, systems that need to be reliable, the building operations, building access, any type of IoT devices related to sensors in the building. <clears throat> Move all that stuff on the CBRS private LTE layer because it stays away from the interference that those other technologies may be subjected to. Well, well let's talk about that. Let's talk about cybersecurity and, and, and you know, obviously as as the operational technology worlds intersect with the information technology worlds, we've got to worry about cybersecurity and hackers and, and all that kind of stuff. Does CBRS bring a special sauce to this that, that other wireless uh, networks don't? Sure. C CBRS is actually inherently more secure than Wi-Fi just based on the SIM-based authentication system that it has. So it has a two-way handshake so that the device recognizes the network and the network recognizes the device versus more of an encryption based uh, method that Wi-Fi would have. So just the nature of the cellular technology that's built into the uh, CBRS makes it more secure than, than Wi-Fi. So as owners start looking at robotic cleaning and robotic parking and applications like that, it would seem that since you've got that, that dual authentication Clearly, there's an opportunity here. Sure. And, and, and what else is unique about Wi-Fi versus CBRS is, so Wi-Fi is it's an unlicensed frequency uh, or unlicensed, unlicensed spectrum. So I can set up a Wi-Fi router next to your building, and we are both operating on the same set of frequencies, where CBRS, the frequencies are actually assigned by the SAS. So we would be operating on a different set of channels. Um, so there's less opportunity for interference on that side as well. And, and David Wright, you know, just doubling back to the FCC and, and the vision, the amazing vision that they had, I, you know, I know it's early days, but have they, have they accomplished the goal? Do you see that, that mm -hmm. what, we're, what we have to look forward to mm -hmm. really is a, you know, from a property owner standpoint, I mean, if you're giving me 150 megahertz of spectrum, and I can now do everything that I need to do on my own segmented 10 megahertz or 20 megahertz, and the rest of that spectrum can be used by my tenants, I I'm a pretty happy guy. But do you think the FCC is, has fulfilled what, they, what they're trying to do here? Right, good question. Um, so as you said, uh, it's been about, let's see, uh, just over five months since we received the authorization for the, the GAA tier, again, that, that sort of quasi-unlicensed tier of operation. Um, we're extremely happy with how things have gone in those first five months. So, you know, we've got tens of thousands of base stations that have been deployed in this band. These are, you know, predominantly small, uh, small and medium power uh, stations, you know, relative to uh, traditional cellular solutions. So, um, yeah. Tens of thousands of small cells deployed in, in uh, five months in the midst of a global pandemic. I'll take that. Um, you know, I, I do think it's safe to say that some of the activity in the enterprise and probably commercial property space has been muted. I mean, you probably got a lot of your tenants who aren't in their buildings right now, and that's just the reality. Um, you know, the, the good news is that, you know, as this thing, whenever this thing starts to, to wane, we're going to be looking for solutions like CBRS to help with additional monitoring in your lobbies. And I know, John, you've, you've got some real good insights about how, how CBRS can help as um, tenants come back into the buildings. But, um, yeah, I think the FCC is happy with how this is shaped up. Um, you know, the alliance, I haven't really talked a whole lot about the alliance, but 
We've got 173 members in our alliance, and it's everybody from AT&T, Verizon, Timo to Charter, Comcast, Cox to um, Crown Castle, Xtanet, uh, Boingo, um, American Tower, which are all you know, DAS slash neutral host uh, tower uh, providers. Um, but then we get into a whole range of more sort of end user constituencies. So I've got uh, people doing multi-tenant dwelling units. I've got commercial property managers. I've got hospitality uh, sector representatives in the membership, um, uh, industrial. Um, so yeah, I think and and you know and deployments are happening really across those sectors. Uh, I think it was Tormon or Rod mentioned the uh, the PAL auction, right? So this is the actual sale of these protected rights um, at the second tier of the uh, the framework. That's actually starting tomorrow. Um, and 271 parties actually qualified to participate in that auction. And again, it's the tier one MNOs, but it's also John Deere and Duke University and Duke Health System and a bunch of other universities and people representing um, you know, commercial and enterprise interests as well. So um, yeah, early days, but I think overall, you know, FCC and we are happy with the uh, with the um, wide adoption. And I think it comes back to use cases. Um, I don't want to take too much time, but, you know, I, I would agree with Paul's point earlier, you know, mm -hmm. you can deploy this as a property manager for private use cases, private connectivity, internal comps today. And then you can also leverage that same framework to provide, um, you know, public cellular connectivity within your property in a neutral host uh, type of uh, implementation. Well, let's jump into that. I, I really think we need to focus on what, what is the value prop for a property owner individual i own one building or i own 50 buildings you know what what is the value proposition uh for property owners you know what should they be thinking about and and what do your individual companies bring to the table rod you want to kick that one off yeah i think the most dis important distinction again is that you know unlike other alternatives you know with a single investment in the cbrs network you're able to really solve two crucial problems. You're able to get you know, this big swath of spectrum that you can use for your internal business operations and that drives an ROI um, across you know, all the different use cases we've been talking about. But then you know, really uniquely for CBRS, it also you know, can serve the users from the public carriers that would come into the space. And it can help create a, a better, higher capacity smartphone experience for um, your occupants coming in. And, you know, I think that unique two-sided model is, uh, you know, drives two sources of ROI. Whereas, you know, DAS system has its source of ROI from tenant satisfaction on cell phone coverage. Wi-Fi has its ROI from internal operations. CBRS gives you both of those business cases in one. Paul, you want to jump on that one? Yeah, definitely will add to that. So, I would say that there's, you know, there's those two cases and maybe there's a third one too, which is for the enterprises that are uh, inside those buildings as well. Um, they can leverage it and they see value out of it. So when you ask what the value proposition is for a building, I think we were just, you know, we, we touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of all the different use cases for a property owner. Um, but it's really important to understand the value proposition to a mobile carrier and the value proposition for enterprises, your tenants. Um, for the carrier, they have desperately wanted to get coverage in your buildings. And in some cases they've done so through DAS, but they found that it's, it's, uh, it's expensive. And so this makes all of that market much, much more addressable. For a building owner, you have to look at it. And I think as uh, Dave or somebody else mentioned, this is not going to replace Wi-Fi. So it's incremental to Wi-Fi and you have to ask, well, how am I gonna fund this and why am I gonna fund it and can I support it on the backs of just these use cases for, on private LTE alone? May or may not be able to do that, but if you can couple the, the value proposition for the carrier with that for the property owner, um, you can get a lot of investment in the space. Yeah, I mean, for us at Rudin, we really, you know, as, as most of you know, we've created an operating system for our buildings called Mantle. And, and the, the, think of it as a big data vacuum cleaner that, that grabs as much data as it possibly can, organize it, blow, organizes it, blows up the silos, and then creates correlations between those data sets. So occupancy is influencing, uh, fan speed is influencing you know, interior temperature. And so for us, 
what we know for a fact, this is not speculation, the more granular data we can grab, the more, the better we can be at operating our buildings as efficiently as we possibly can and delivering an experience to our customers that's as valuable as it possibly can be. Like cutting hot and cold calls by 75 to 80%, simply by being able to anticipate discomfort, fixing it before it's actually felt. So for us, as we, we looked at this and we kept bumping up against our tenants networks as we tried to get into their spaces and grab data, not data that they would care about, ultimately, unless we were doing something with it that, that we're concerned about, but data like more granular temperature data, more granular indoor air quality data, more granular you know, occupancy data in terms of space utilization. As we grab that, and as we're working with you know, our very large customers, like a, like a BlackRock, by giving them that data, they were able to drive down their consumption patterns by 30% on top of the 40% that we were already able to save them. So for this, for, for us, I don't have to bump up against anybody's network. I don't have to have deal with any interference issues. I know right now that I can grab that data, do it you know, cleanly, efficiently, uh, without touching, getting anywhere near or interfering with networks that are my tenants' networks. So to me, this is, that's why I'm so excited about it because it, it clearly solved the problem that we were trying to solve uh, in a way that was visionary and ultimately forward thinking. Uh, so that, that's why, why we're, we're so all excited about it. Uh, Tormod, do you, you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously so far it's, it's been focused on what could, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the CBRS or the, the private uh, 5G network in addition to, to, to you know, serving the, uh, you know, I think now we said both the building owners, the m and and the enterprise, um, but the underlying infrastructure you put in to support this um, is also capable of supporting the m and leveraging their spectrum that they spent billions of dollars. And in some buildings, um, CBRS might not um, either be enough spectrum or they have concerns because they have regulatory uh, requirements like ENO1 and Kalea and stuff like that. And they might want to use their spectrum just because you know they have a higher market penetration for those uh, frequency bands that are outside CBRS, but the backbone infrastructure is still there. It's the same that you could use for both CBRS um, for you know small cell networks that are supporting uh, license spectrum, and you know even some of your non wireless uh, connectivity where you could actually use that fiber and that infrastructure. And um, as we start taking it kind of to the next level, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion in the industry about edge compute. When you have that network, um, you know, you were talking about big data for your operations. Um, it's companies out there that are very interested in that on a, a more global basis and even extending the cloud. You know, um, my CEO say, look, People talk about IoT in, in this context. The real IoT is actually the infrastructure of things. And the CBRS is, is a important element of that infrastructure to support IoT and, and, and extending the cloud and edge and all of the hype that we hear about. So um, I think you know, holistically, and that's kind of who we are as you know, our shared infrastructure provider, um, we see this as a really an accelerator to deployments of, of infrastructure in a number of different market verticals across uh, the nation. So Tormod, would you say that CBRS would help property owners future-proof their buildings from an infrastructure standpoint? Yes, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I purposely kind of say private 5G, and it's because I think it's gonna be how you take that neat next leap into the next generation of uh, next connectivity, and you you mentioned one thing in terms of granularity of data. You know, in our business, we've been talking about densification, and and that's what need to happen to the infrastructure. Is to give you the more granularity. We also need a underlying infrastructure 
that has a higher density to be able to unramp all that data, and in some instances, even push that data out. And, and, and I think CBRS is, is a great catalyst to, to drive that uh, architecture. And you, know, you just mentioned all the you know, value prop to you, and, and I think that could, could kind of help the business case to make these deployments happen. And Bill, are the, are the sensor manufacturers catching up to this? Are they understanding how important CBRS is? Do we have to wait for a whole new line of, of CBRS enabled gadgets to be able to use the spectrum? The, the device ecosystem for CBRS is growing uh, regularly. It's growing pretty rapidly. We see that the, the latest iPhones, the latest Galaxies and iPads are, are all capable of band 48. Um, so we can look for all of the flagship smartphones that, that most people are carrying to have that. Um, the LTE routers and, and um, wireless gateways are all catching up to the band 48. So the ecosystem is there um, and it's catching up with the use cases. So as more devices become available, I think you'll start to see people uh, developing use cases that they didn't think were possible with this bands previously. Rod and Paul, you want to comment on that at all? Uh, sure. I mean, I think that uh, we were very optimistic about that. Um, you know, we're seeing the the uh, chipsets uh, come into you know a broad range of devices. Um, I know that the CBRS lines keeps account of of what's what's been certified there and, and that's always growing. Um, and so we've got, you know, all the things that, you know, for industrial applications, right? If they want to have a mobile router that's uh, installed in a, in a forklift or a outdoor vehicle, if you want to have a rugged laptop, uh, those are available with CBRS built in. The iPad, which is, uh, you know, we see used a lot in, in construction sites. Uh, so, you know, we don't anymore really feel like the device ecosystem is holding us back. And, you know, there's plenty of plenty of devices that, that drive the applications that drive real return. And so we really see that, you know, the, the business is getting up and going. Yes, so John, I'd repeat that, you know, not only is the device ecosystem coming along, there's a lot of other pieces of the ecosystem that are coming along as well. So without getting too technical, um, on the, network side, a lot can be virtualized. So in th that sense, it can be the same equipment, but it feels like it's your private network uh, for you as a building owner. Um, to a carrier, it can feel like it's their own network, so they can publish their own PLMN ID, which, which is what the handsets look for when they say, is this a Verizon network? Is it another network? Um, 5G upgradability um, is being built into some of the devices uh, that are coming along. So there's a lot of other pieces and that say on the handset side, it's not just the devices, but the handsets. And I saw one question up already as well. Um, the handsets can be dual SIM. And so it's not like you need permission uh, from a carrier to use that private network. You can have your network sense it and have that uh, handset move uh, to, to that network. So um, there's a lot of other pieces coming along that, that increase the value of, of this. That's good to, good to hear. You know, we, we've touched John, on- Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just uh, one final point on that, and I, I, you know, I would encourage people, as Rod said, you can go to CBRSAlliance.org under certifications, and you can see a list of both the FCC authorized infrastructure equipment um, base stations, but more importantly, for the point of this uh, particular topic, you can see all the end user devices or client devices that have been authorized by the FCC. And it is really diverse and growing. Um, so yeah, encourage people to do that. Well, one thing really, really important, and I pointed this out earlier, these frequency ranges have been available for um, TDD LTE service for about 10 years. And that's why we have a very robust chipset uh, ecosystem and equipment ecosystem, because this is not just a US thing, it's really a global thing. Uh, again, LTE for, you know, call it the last decade. And these are also frequency ranges which are identified as pioneer bands or leading bands for 5G. So I think we're going to see a robust 5G equipment ecosystem evolve. It's not in place today. I'm not saying that. But I think we will see a, a robust 5G ecosystem going forward as well. Terrific. And David, while I've got you, there's a, one question that's come in. Can David Wright point to one instance 
of a commercially available public cellular CBRS deployment? Sure. I mean, by the letter of that question, I can, um, right? It's even received a lot of coverage. I, I'm not sure it's what the questioner is asking, but I mean, Verizon, right? So Verizon was just in, in the press, I think, in the last couple of weeks about how they're essentially putting CBRS in, in every one of their you know, PICO and small cell sites if they go out and touch them. You know, they now have to actually uh, explain why they're not putting CBRS into a site if they if they go out and they touch it. So that's you know a public uh, cellular deployment using CBRS. But I think the question probably is more about what I was alluding to, where you know we were encouraging property owners to consider, you know, you can use this today for private connectivity needs, internal connectivity needs, and then open it up to the subscribers of the mobile operators going forward. I think that's probably what the questioner was was getting to. Um, no, I can't point to that today. Um, I think that's an evolutionary thing. Um, you know, I will say I'm aware of one very significant um, enterprise that is planning to do just that, and I think we'll see that in the you know, um, in the coming months, and there'll be a lot of hay made about that when it occurs. Um, you know, I think private uh, you know private needs will drive this in the short term. I think it was uh, Paul who made the point that um, you know the tier one mobile operators are looking for ways to maintain those subscriber relationship when their subscribers are in building. That's a known. That's a known fact. Eighty percent of wireless data usage occurs indoors. Um, so I think as these networks are deployed uh, in building for the internal private communications needs, it's only you know logical that the MNOs are going to want to you know leverage that. It's not their capex, right? Now the capex is potentially being borne by the business, but you know they can they can have a cellular experience with that subscriber in somebody else's building on their infrastructure. And, you know, Wi-Fi calling is the harbinger of why this will happen, right? Um, for the longest time, you know, we didn't have great voice coverage inside. Then all of a sudden we were realized, you know, hey, there's Wi-Fi pretty much everywhere. Why not leverage that for voice services? And I think I'm doing this, and my voice right now is over Wi-Fi. Um, it's, you know, I won't say the name of my carrier, but they're happy to let my voice flow, uh, my voice you know, service with them flow over this Wi-Fi connection. Same thing will happen with uh, with CBRS LTE and 5G. John, and the good news the good news is we can hear you loud and clear, David. <laughs> John, it's, well, it's, my company, it's my company's Wi-Fi. <laughs> John, I've got to drop off to do uh, the next panel in 15 minutes, but I would just like to uh, uh, thank everyone on the panel before I go, and you guys can continue after I leave. I just want to uh, encourage everybody to go and visit our uh, all of our exhibitor booths um, and uh, most of the folks on the panel here have exhibitor booths on the floor. As a matter of fact, all of them um, have uh, 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 booths on the floor of the uh, exhibit hall. Please go visit those. Um, and uh, I want to, again, thank all of you for being part of this. And thank you, um, everyone who's listening in today. And I'm going to drop and let you continue on, John. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. You, you know, let's let's go to the enterprise. You know, as we, as we stay on the... Uh, focus on, on the, the value prop for property owners. You know, when, when we started doing a lot of, of technology research, you know, Bill Rudin gave us a, who's our CEO, uh, gave us a very simple uh, instruction, which was whatever you're doing, if it doesn't help me attract or retain a customer, I don't care about it. So how, do, how will CBRS help property owners attract and retain customers based upon the infrastructure that'll be installed uh, to support CBRS. Uh, Paul, I'll let, you, I'll let you start with that one. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times you hear the analogy with, you know, it's, it's, basic, it's becoming basic plumbing. So there'll be an expectation over time um, and it'll be a question that, that comes up the same way apartment dwellers may ask, hey, do I have coverage for my carrier in this building? An enterprise may say, uh, is this building already plumbed with CBRS and do I have access to it? Uh, because for an enterprise, it's not just about um, being able to run their own private applications. Uh, but as Torm had mentioned, I think we're at the cusp of a combination of private LTE and edge. So they're going to expect to be able to run a lot of their applications locally, run on a fully private network. So um, in terms of you know, driving up occupancy in the buildings, um, I think it'll be important for, for, for that and a number of other reasons. Rod, you want to take that? 
Yeah, same things um, that we see, um, you know, and, and as you talked about, John, that, you know, the, to the extent that we can, you, you have a network, a communications network that allows you to build up a, a richer sensor network and collect more data and reuse that data, you know, in your operating system to, you know, provide a better tenant experience. Um, you know, that's, that just, you know, it's all feeds back on itself. And, you know, a lot, a lot more things are going to be delivered, you know, on an app basis, mobile, mobile app basis, whether that's, you know, you know, ordering from the cafeteria, having food delivered, or, um, you know, at some point, you know, ordering up your autonomous vehicle to come pick you up, right? So this, the density of, of wireless coverage that we're going to need inside buildings to drive all this, um, you know, digital transformation is, is just going to be enormous. And uh, this, you know, CBRS infrastructure um, is a great foundation for that. And Tormod, you, you know, you, you mentioned briefly this whole concept of, of edge versus cloud versus on-prem uh, storage and, and analysis of data. Can, can you drill down a little bit more on that and, and how CBRS can enable, uh, you know, that as, as people may or may not become concerned about the sensitivity of data that's being sent to the cloud and they want to keep it on premises? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, a lot of times when, when you hear discussions about the edge, um, people are very concerned about, like you said, where the data is either stored or where you do the compute. But that can't be in isolation, right? You need to have the on-ramp of that data into that um, data center, you know, edge data center or on-prem data center if you want. And um, so, so that's where CBRS is coming in and actually creating an edge infrastructure, not just the edge data center, but actually the, both the, the on-ramp and having the security that's associated with, 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 with CBRS um, really kind of playing well into that. You also have a lot of those applications you want to run at the edge. One, you want it to be secure, they also, a lot of times, uh, close to real-time applications. So when we're talking about, you know, autonomous uh, manufacturing, those type of things, they're obviously latency sensitive. And that's where, you know, the CBRS network combined with having the compute and potentially the storage, or sometimes just aggregating the data uh, on-prem makes so much sense, right? And, and, and so these are things that are, um, coexisting, right? And that's also the difference between, yes, the carriers and from a public or nationwide network are using the same technology, but they're thinking about it plain vanilla in, in a city, not being able to zoom down to on a building level and being able to drive that same, um, um, you know, privacy and, and, and adopt to actually those applications that are specific to you know, in your case, maybe your tenant or just to your own application. So you could have a much closer uh, integration uh, and, and, and making sure that the performance are, 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 are tied to the applications you're running. So I think, you know, from a company like ourselves, um, we, we see that the application layer becoming obviously more critical and understanding how that kind of posts the, the, the requirements to the infrastructure. Yeah, we, when we start getting into location-based services and and really, you know, having a you know a full granular coverage over a building, it, it truly is amazing that the, of of what can be enabled and and actualized within a an office building. You know, thank you for that, Tormont. Let, let's switch quickly to the you know what's the economic model for for property owners? What's the the cost of these things? Is it is it the the owner's dime? Is it the carrier's dime? Uh, you know, what, what are the economic models here? Well, maybe we just take a, a first stab at it. <laughs> sure, go ahead, Tormod. And then, uh, you know, I know Rod and Paul, I'm sure have thoughts on that. Bill and, and David, please chime in. Yeah, I, I think, you know, as a building owner, I think you're in a unique situation, right? Um, I didn't mention it earlier, but, you know, at an at enterprise level, I think it could be hard for uh, external entities to really sell a private LD into, into the enterprise. You know, they've been 
used to deploying Wi-Fi. So I think, you know, as, as, a, as a building owner, you could kind of put yourself in a position of uh, really um, help monetize the digital real estate that basically, uh, you know, Seabrest could be here, right? So you have obviously your, your applications and, 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 and how you, um, uh, you know, are, are driving more efficiencies in the operations, which I think is also something that you could monetize, like you mentioned with your, your tenants. Then you have tenant services. Um, and then, you know, we talk about the, 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 the carriers. So I think that is, is where, you know, it's a, we have an offering we call infrastructure as service where we work with building owners like yourself. You know, we are good at building the networks and operate them and, and, and do that efficiently. You have access to a number of various ways of monetizing it specifically relative to your tenants and your own and then we could bring in the the carrier component um, and and help uh, that and it's, it's a couple of different ways that that could be done um, and you know it could be a mix of of of, of some capital and in some cases um, even leveraging the infrastructure you already have in there to build the CBRS network you have you know most probably fiber networks and you have other things that could be contributed to, to make it more cost effective. So yeah, it's, it's a little bit of, of flexibility around that, but I think it's an opportunity for uh, real estate owners in general to, uh, to get a structured model in around uh, monetizing that, that digital real estate. And you know, I know we were several companies on here that that, that we could help do in that for, for real estate owners because we are you know, infrastructure operators. So, so I, I would agree with Torman uh, pretty much everything he said. And I'd also say that's a position Crown Castle takes as well as you know, build, own, and operate in, in, in particular finance uh, these things as well. Um, I think that one of the things when we talked about all the, the ecosystem coming along and, we, and I mentioned dual SIM and other things, um, there's some cynicism around what carriers will and won't do. So first I'd say technically it's all possible. So it's a question of do the carriers want to participate or do they want to participate? Um, Crown was known originally as a tower company. 20 years ago, uh, carriers felt like they all had to own their own towers and they learned over time it's so much more capital efficient if they don't own all own their own towers. Um, same kind of thing can happen here. But now you have even more players involved. So as a building owner, you have an asset that's very attractive to the carriers. How do I get access to that building? So there are opportunities for the infrastructure investment that needs to be made for you to put in private LTE, for example, to be financed on the backs of carriers have an interest of being in those buildings as well. Um, and from a Crown Castle perspective, if we can find a way to do that economically where everybody wins, that's what we look for. And there you get you 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 get a jump start on 5G because it's unlicensed and you don't have to wait for for owning any 5G 5G licenses. So that's a beautiful yeah, just, thing. Yeah, and I'll just tell you in parallel, all these people that are looking at edge computing, there's a lot of edge computing that will take off in the long run because carriers have 5G and they'll have data breaking out at the edge towers elsewhere. But if you really get in deep with the the Amazons and the Googles and others, they'll tell you that they expect a lot of it to take off on private LTE to start with because you can break out and you can do all the things that you want to do on 5G now, plus you can upgrade these devices to 5G. Because that's software, not hardware at that point. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, that is related to the, to the business model is, you know, how, how does this happen in a, in a simple enough way for it to scale, right? We've, we've talked about devices and SIM cards and SAS, uh, you know, spectrum access services and, and you know it could sound a little bit complicated uh, compared to other alternatives, right? And I think one of the things that we need to emphasize as a group of companies here is, you know, that's really not true. And m many of us here on the panel, you know, our businesses are devoted to offering packages of services that, you know, will make it easy for the building owner to you know, take on this technology and deploy it within your operations. And so it's not only a matter of you know, who pays, of course it's you know, how much anyone pays and then you know, how hard is it to get done? Um, you know, most of our companies here have experience in deploying DAS networks and we know that that is still a somewhat complicated 
process in terms of all the steps you have to go through. And, and I think we'll, we'll see that with CBRS, we can, you know, dramatically simplify that and make this a lot more Wi-Fi like uh, in terms of the experience and, uh, and allow business to, to take advantage of this technology in a scalable way. Well, yeah, it's John, interesting. When, when, we, when we started doing 55 Broad Street back in the mid 90s, a lot of the carriers would come in and say, well, we want to solve the last mile issue. Last mile being touching the customer. And, and I kept looking at them. I'm, got, I'm like, guys, don't you understand that that's the first mile? You know, the, the, the networks start where the customer is and wherever your equipment is, that's fine. So now what's so fascinating to me about CBRS is that it's truly established the building where the customer sits as the first mile. Uh, sorry to interrupt you there, Paul. Yeah, no, I was just going to say building on something that, that both Tormund and Rod said. First, I, I think Tormund um, just commented that there's a couple of ways you can do that, which is great underestimation there's like a thousand different ways you can slice this thing and so i know uh, you know that as well um but uh to ron's point you know as an industry for you know for exodent and crown and geoverse and the rest of us we have to find ways to make it easy uh for the customers to buy the fact that is right now we're i'll call out we're early on in the industry uh i think uh there was a mention that you know it's just five months ago that all this lit up and so every business model under the sun is being considered. Every product uh, permutation under the sun is being considered, but at some point we'll narrow down on some things that are just that much easier um, to, to kind of understand, buy, and implement. So we're in the early days of that, but we're all gearing towards that, towards, you know, productizing it, making this easily scalable, but it's ready today. Well, we are bumping up. I can't believe an hour went so quickly. We're bumping up right against two yeah. o'clock. I'm going to let each of you you know, take 30 seconds to uh, say maybe something that you didn't get a chance to say, and we'll start with you, Bill. Sure, I think, um, I think in, to sum, sum this up, you know, CBRS, there's two major obstacles that prevent technology from being deployed in a building, and it's, it's take too long or cost too much. A lot of the CBRS system elements can be virtualized in the cloud, and it's also a scalable technology, so, if you want to deploy it in the lobby day one and find your use cases, you can do that and then scale it to the rest of the building when you start to get uh, some use cases as, as the demand grows. Rod. Yeah, I just, you know, I think um, the t title of the panel is, uh, you know, private networks you can own. And, you know, that's so appropriate because, you know, what we're, what's really changed here is the idea that there is spectrum built for cellular that individual enterprises and real estate owners can act on without there having to be you know, a huge level of coordination amongst a whole lot of uh, parties with different interests. And you know, that, that was really the, 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 the catalyst here for what's gonna make the uh, wireless industry of the future very different than the past. Tormod. Yeah, so kind of playing off that, uh, I think you know you, under the, what do you mean with own, right? Some extent is actually control that maybe is more important than exactly owning it because, you know, I think we, we were dancing around a little bit the cost and, you know, you could compare, you know, CBRS to Wi-Fi, compare it to DAS, um, it's still gonna be, you know, a, a, a cost there. And, and so really, I, I kind of look at kind of actually on the opposite side of it. What's the value? What are the things you could use it for and that's what's so exciting with, with CBRS. It's expanding, you know, the things that you might have been challenged with in the past. And you kind of mentioned that some of the challenges you have had with not interfering with your your, your tenants. And and so I think it's it's that multi-mode, you know, use cases and, and that way also the 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 the, the value prop is, is more of the, the focus and and you know, a little bit around the business models, obviously, is how do we tie these various um, parties that could use the network and, and, and extend the value beyond that. And, and, and that's really the opportunity as an industry. Um, and I think Paul said it a little bit about, um, we just need to be careful we're not confusing and, 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 and throwing too much at it, um, maybe in these early stages, because that could slow down the, 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 the deployments. But, it, it is really a lot of, of, of great opportunities and a lot of, of excitement around that. And that's 
Um, I think we, we heard that uh, throughout this panel and appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody today. Paul. Yeah, I would just say CBRS is a gift to property owners and I would urge you to take advantage of it. And um, we talked through a few you know, complex issues, but it's simpler than it sounds. Um, and all of these pieces are coming together. So take advantage of it. That'd be my Dave, message. Thanks, Paul. David. Yeah, I'm gonna echo Rod and Paul. This is a, a huge opportunity. Um, you know, just this access to cellular spectrum for everyone um, and the fact that it does involve the carriers and the cable operators. I mean, it's this ecosystem and the fact that you've got the AT&T and Verizon's driving equipment availability. So um, yeah, huge opportunity. Property owners need to look at it. And if I could deploy a CBRS network and I've got a dual SIM thing here, my mobile operator subscription is on the eSIM and I've got a private SIM for my local connection. I deployed it. If I can do it, anybody can do it. It's that simple. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you, David. And just from the property owner standpoint, uh, you know, there's, there was a book that was written by Nicholas Negroponte back in the, the mid nineties uh, called Being Digital. And if you're a property owner and if you care about being digital, you got to focus on CBRS because ultimately CBRS is that platform that's going to bring you into the digital world if you're not there already. So thank you all, uh, the, my panelists. You're all amazing all-stars. And uh, I look forward to uh, speaking to you in the, in the near future. And um, everybody stay safe and uh, be well. Thank you thank all. You, uh, thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.